when we get into the word. Amen. And I bring you greetings from my wife, Denise, and from my little daughter, Heaven, as well. Isn't that what we all desire to be? She stands as a constant reminder of the character that I need to have so that I can make it to heaven. I thank the Lord for my wife and my daughter because in my home life I'm realizing more and more how much I need Jesus, how much more patient I need to be, how much more kind and gentle and loving I need to be. Dealing with my wife and with my daughter, it's like looking into the mirror every day. That mirror sends me to my knees. And brothers and sisters, that's the place where we need to be right now, on our knees. We need to be on our knees because we truly are living in the last days. I'm not saying this with any uncertainty in my voice or in my heart. I know that we're living in the last days. And now more than ever, we need to make our calling and election sure. Because very shortly from now, Jesus Christ will remove his high priestly garments. And he will return not as the lamb slain on the cross, but as the conquering lamb, the king of kings and lord of lords, to redeem the called and the chosen and the faithful. God will have a people that will vindicate his character in this last generation. The Bible is very clear in the book of Romans, chapter 3, beginning at verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true. And every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. God will never be looked upon as a fool. No man will ever have occasion to mock God. Because God's word stands fast and it will be revealed to be that which can never be controverted. God is a God of truth. And he'll have a people that are a people of truth. That will vindicate his character in this great controversy. So that is without question. The question is, will you be one of those individuals? And you're the one that answers that question. Every day. Every choice you make, every thought that you allow to course through your mind, you're making the choice whether or not you will be one of those creatures that were made in the image of God and in his likeness that will reveal his character in these last hours of our earth's existence to vindicate the character of the almighty God. What is your choice? Before we get into the word of God this evening as it is, My tradition, and I'm not one that believes in traditions per se, but this is one that I am not uh, ashamed of. Number one, I ask you to please pray for yourselves. I believe every time that the word of God is open, that the spirit of God is at hand to impress his truth upon our minds. There is absolutely nothing that I can say that can be of any benefit to any individual in this room at this time. Absolutely nothing. You did not come here to hear a man. You came here to hear from the spirit of God. I am nothing. I am dust. Without the Lord, I have no ability to be of any benefit to anyone. Therefore, if you desire to hear something, no, rather, if you desire to have an experience with God this evening, that will strengthen you in your relationship with Jesus Christ and take you one step higher on the ladder that will lead you to the heavenly Canaan, then I counsel you strongly under, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God that you must pray and ask for the Spirit of God to speak to you, move upon your heart, open up your understanding, teach you and empower you to walk in the will of our Lord and our Creator. And then number two, please pray for myself. I know that I'm just a fallible man. I'm just in need of the sp- I'm just as much in need of the spirit as anyone else in this room. So please pray for me that God will use me for his glory. So as it is my tradition, I'm going to kneel at this time. And if you're so inclined to do so, I invite you to kneel with me as we go before the throne of God. I'm going to give each person in here 60 seconds to pray for yourself and then I'll close in prayer. Do not be praying all over the place, or do not pray for 
everything under the sun. Pray specifically for this moment in time that the Spirit of God will speak to you and reveal to you what God's will is for your life. Let us pray. Abba Father, my maker and my king. I give you thanks on this your holy Sabbath day for the favor that you have shown unto your servant. And all of these, my brothers and my sisters, you have set a hedge of protection about us. You've kept us on all sides. You've provided for all of our daily needs. And now you bring us into your courts to worship your holy name. You bring us into your presence to open our ears and open our eyes that we might see and that we might hear and that in Christ Jesus we might experience the joy of salvation. All praise and all honor and all glory belong unto thee and to the Lamb. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy. Thank you, God, for being who thou art. I come and I kneel, and I come boldly because you told me to come boldly. And so according to your word, be it unto your servants this evening, I pray that you would grant us the Holy Spirit. You said the spirit of truth would guide us into all truth. We need him, Lord. We need him to teach us. We need him to chasten us, to break us and refashion us in your image. Oh, Father, please wake us up and guide us in the way everlasting. I ask for the holy angels that excel in strength those that are mighty in battle, those that are valiant, O oh God, in your service, that you'd send them here even now into your heavenly sanctuary, O oh Lord, into your earthly sanctuary. And may they go from person to person, from pew to pew, and prick our hearts and turn our minds upward that we might pierce the veil that separates this world from the unseen and realize that although the bills are still coming and the phone calls are coming and the internet is still running and the world is moving at a rapid pace, the controversy, oh God, is raging. And that which we cannot see is that which is most important. For there is a war going on for our souls. This is what you have taught us. But I pray that you would help us to embrace this reality this evening. To choose. To choose like the wise and not like the fool. And so now with all the angels I say, lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. You and you alone are the King of glory. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. 
Revelation chapter 7. Once again, the book of Revelation chapter 7, and we are going to begin at verse 1. Once again, that's the book of Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Brothers and sisters, when I ask you to open your Bibles, I really mean open your Bibles. Please don't look at my face, because when we leave here this evening, I want to leave you with the word of God. Amen? The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. And after these things, I beheld four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, so that the winds would not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels, unto whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Right now, as we are sitting here in God's sanctuary, the word of God is clear. It lets us know that God has stationed four angels at the four corners of planet Earth. They stand as centurions, if you will. And their only mission, their only objective that has been given to them by God himself is to hold back the four winds, to hold back satanic strife, deception and destruction from touching down on planet earth and sweeping away the human family. But these angels, these heavenly messengers will only hold this position of importance for a probationary period of time. For the word of God is clear. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 2, there is another angel other than these four that ascends from the east. He has within his possession the seal of the living God, and he cries with a loud voice unto the other four angels, and his cry is, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. As you should know, or as you may know, in the forehead is located what? The frontal lobe. In the frontal lobe is where the reasoning and the judgment processes take place. In the frontal lobe is where character development, character formation takes place, brothers and sisters. And God wants to seal us up in our what? Foreheads. God desires to place something within the characters of all those who profess to be his servants before he allows a time of trouble such as never was to ensue on planet Earth. And if you do not have this seal, if you are found without this seal, when the winds are let loose, you will be removed from God's creation forever. Amen. But that is not God's desire for any of us. For he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God did not desire to save all of us, those winds would have been let loose a long time ago. But Jesus pleads his blood even now. Hold! Hold, hold, Father, hold those winds until my servants are sealed in their foreheads. Bible lets us know exactly what it is that God is trying to seal up within us in the book of Isaiah. Go with me there, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Once again, that's the book of Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Please, when you have it, just say amen. The word of God tells us. In the book of Isaiah, the 8th chapter, and verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law of what? Seal the law amongst my disciples. It is the law of God that he is trying to seal up 
within all those who profess to be his servants. Do you profess to be a servant of God this evening? Is the law of God hidden in your heart? Can you say like Christ, I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Do you have that experience right now? Do you feel safe in the bosom of our elder brother and our high priest Jesus Christ right now? Well, brothers and sisters, that means we need the seal. We need the law of God inscribed upon the tablets of our hearts. God says he wants to bind up his law within his disciples. Because God knows that if he can place his law in our hearts, a radical transformation will take place within our lives. Notice the Bible says that he wants to place his law in our what? In our hearts. Why our hearts? Why our hearts? Why not just our minds? Why can't we just have an intellectual understanding of the truth? Because it's not sufficient. God wants our desires to be for him. He wants us to love him with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. Yes, he wants us to have an intellectual understanding of who he is and why he does the things that he does. Because in any relationship, there must be a mutual understanding of whom each of these individuals in the relationship are. God wants us to know him. But to know God truly is to love him. And as we look into his law and behold his character, that he's a God that is merciful, that is just, that is long-suffering, that is kind. Just look at how he's dealt with humanity. Just take the opportunity to look in the mirror and see how he's dealt with you. And you can see how loving God is, how patient he is. You know, if it was you that was sitting upon the throne, you wouldn't even be here anymore. You know, be honest, you know that you would have been already undone if you were the one wielding the scepter. But God, God in his unmatched love, with a heart that is more pitiful and tender than any mother for her child, still pleading, still prompting, still pushing, doing everything he possibly can do to awaken love in our hearts so that the things of this world will no longer have a hold upon us and that will desire him more than life itself. Oh, he wants to place his law in us because if he can place his law in us in this fashion, a radical transformation will take place within our lives. You know what I'm talking about. The Bible talks about it in the book of Psalms chapter 19. Go with me there. Psalms 19. Let's just look at verse 7. Some of us sing this. I, if we don't sing it, we need to learn how to sing the scripture songs. Sing those scripture songs. You don't know how to memorize scripture? Start singing those scripture songs. Help you to lodge the word of God in your mind. Sing them to your children so your children have the word of God hidden in their hearts. You want your children to stand in this hour? You must work for them so that they can stand. Bible says in the book of Psalms 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. See, we need to be converted. So many come to these meetings month after month, maybe two or three months. There's a gap in between before you have another meeting of this nature. Next week, there'll be another preacher preaching and another preacher preaching. And oh, how you come and you get convicted. But how many of us are converted? It's not enough to be convicted, brothers and sisters. When John the Baptist told Herod that his sin was an abomination in the sight of the living God, oh, he was convicted. He was convicted enough to lop off the head of John the Baptist and then die in his sin. Oh, he was convicted. When Paul had audience with King Agrippa and he preached to him the gospel of the kingdom, oh, King Agrippa said, oh, thou almost persuadest me to become a Christian. Oh, Paul, King, Agrippa, he, King Agrippa, he was convicted. But Paul went from his presence. King Agrippa didn't move on his conviction. 
King Agrippa never got another opportunity to accept the gospel message. He died in his sins. Oh, thou almost persuadest me. Brothers and sisters, you better be more than almost persuaded this evening. Because conviction is not enough. We need to be converted Christians. God wants his law in our hearts because he wants to transform us into new creatures that will reflect the beauty of his omnipotent, awesome, everlasting glory. Do you understand that we were made for the purpose of revealing the glory of God? Do you understand what that means, that you were made to reveal the glory of God? Do you comprehend, as much as your finite mind can, what God is saying in this? In the book of Exodus, chapter 33, beginning at verse 18, I believe it is, when Moses was speaking face to face with God, because he found favor with God because God said to Moses, Moses, I know thee by name. Am I right? He said, I know thee by name. <laughs> Moses said, God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Because God said, Moses, I'm going to do the thing that you asked of me because I know who you are. Then Moses said, well, God, show me who you are. Let me know you like you know me. And God said, I'll make my, all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. And then going over to chapter 34, chapter 34 of the book of Exodus, beginning at verse 5, the Bible tells us, and the Lord descended in a cloud. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord thy God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation, brothers and sisters, the glory of God is his character. It's his character. We are talking about the character of the infinite, eternal God. We were made to be the agents that God desires to reveal that character through. How long will it take for that to take place? Eternity. It will take eternity for us to be able to perfectly reveal his character to all of the unfallen universe. And that is why humanity is a special order of creation. We were made with infinite potential. We were made with the ability to grow infinitely. Do you understand what you are? You are the only vessel within God's creation that can actually <laughs> have mercy, that can actually bear all of the glory of God. Oh, you don't believe that. You don't believe that. See, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 when it spoke of Lucifer, it says that thou shalt take up this proverb against the prince of Tyrus and say, Come on, brother, and turn your Bible there. Ezekiel. I want you to see this. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. Are you there? Come on now. Ezekiel, chapter 28. Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. Ezekiel, chapter 28. Have mercy, O Lord. Have mercy, O Lord. 
and verse 12, the Bible says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon who? And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum." full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And we know that this king of Tyrus here is speaking of the fallen angel Lucifer because the Bible is very clear. If we just jump down to verse 14, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou hast perfect in all thy ways. From the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. He was perfect until iniquity was found in him. But before iniquity was found in him, he was perfect. How perfect? The Bible said that he sealed up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Well, brothers and sisters, what does it mean the, when the Bible says he sealed up the sum? This is an eight-ounce bottle of water. Now, if I was to take this bottle and open it up and pour all the water out and then go to the faucet, how much water could I put in this bottle? Eight ounces. And then when I place the cap back on this bottle, what will I have done? Sealed up the sum. This is all that this bottle could contain. Did you catch what I just shared with you? Lucifer, as an angel, possessed all that that order of creation could bear of the glory and the beauty and the wisdom of God. All that that order of creation could bear. But humanity is a different order of creation. Humanity is an absolutely different order of creation from the angelic host. The Bible is clear on it. With me, and Go with me now to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. Humanity is a completely different order of creation. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews, the second chapter, beginning at verse 6. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. Please, when you have it, say amen. Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 6. Wonderful words of life. The Bible tells us, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor and hast set him over the works of thine hand. The Bible says that humanity was made what? A little lower than the angels. However, if you look at the original Greek of that phrase, a little lower than. Matter of fact, some of your Bibles have it contained right there in the reference next to the scripture. It does not simply mean, and I heard a wow. It does not simply mean that humanity was made a little lower than the angels and will always remain lower than the angels. Brothers and sisters, that phrase means that we were made for a little while lower. For a little while lower. We have been placed on probation. We have been placed on a probationary period. And during this time of probation, God is looking to see if we will consecrate our entire existence to giving him the glory. And if we find ourselves faithful in this thing, by daily surrendering our hearts to being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and allowing our minds to be governed by the Spirit of God to chasten and direct our footsteps in the will of the Lord, we will not only one day be lifted up to stand on the same platform as the angels, but we will be lifted above the angels. Oh, you don't believe me? You say, brother, we don't need to go that far. I'd be happy enough just to be on the same plane as the angels. Oh, I would be too, but God says it. I won't be happy that way. I have something more that I've designed for you. Bible tells us this in no uncertain terms in the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. 
the message to the Laodicean church, the people living under a time period of judgment, the final church that will live before the coming of Jesus Christ. The faithful and true witness presents a promise to us. He says, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. No angel, not even Lucifer, was ever extended the privilege of sharing the throne of God. The closest that the angels have ever gotten is to stand by the throne of God, to cover the glory of the almighty God, to look down on his work. But oh no, humanity will sit in the very throne of the king of the universe. Why? Because we were made to be the very vessels in which God dwells. Lucifer said in his heart, I will be like the Most High. God says, no, you won't, but they will. if we choose to allow God to place his seal on us. God is waiting for a people that he can lift up from the degradation of sin and place his seal on them. I have a short testimony I'd like to share with you and then I'm gonna close because I want you all back here tomorrow I said you all. A few years ago, as I worked as a call porter, the Lord would bless me. Wonderful experiences. It got to the point I knew every day when I went out, I was going to get a Bible study. And so I started getting bolder. I said, Lord, I don't just want one Bible study. I want two Bible studies. Lord, I want three Bible studies. Every day I went out, I would get Bible studies. And many times as I was call porting, I would spend the majority of my day doing a Bible study with somebody. And then when I finished and I hit the street and went back out, out there again, I'd meet my quota within the hour. Boom. Because the Lord brought me to a point in my understanding that the most important thing to do was seek his will and not my prosperity. And I remember this one day, I wasn't able to go out and do my regular call porting because I had a, a dental appointment. And I remember coming back from the dentist and I got these antibiotics that I wouldn't take now, but I took then. And I remember I went to the, uh, the pharmacy and I put in my prescription and I was getting ready to leave out of the pharmacy and the Lord told me go sit down open your Bible read it and I went and I sat down and I opened my Bible and I began to read and there was a, a older lady that was sitting diagonally across from me in the waiting area and she made mention of the fact that I was reading a, a good book and I said the best it's my favorite and then we began to talk about the Bible and then in the midst of this conversation, I said, this is my Bible study for the day. I said, ma'am, would you be interested in studying the Bible with me? She said, I would love to study the Bible with you. My husband and I, we would love to study the Bible with you. And it came out in this conversation by way of some things that we talked about, this, that this woman had quite a bit of money. And so she gave me her information and I took her information and I was excited and I was there waiting for my prescription and then she said, okay, I have to go now. I thought she was waiting to receive a prescription herself because she was there in the waiting area before I got there. Oh no, she was just waiting for me. And so she began to get up out of her chair to make her way out of the pharmacy and I noticed that as she was making her way out of the chair, that she could not walk that well. She had a, a, a poor gait. And I, being taught to be a gentleman, I, 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 I offered to assist her to her vehicle. 
And so I kind of got up under her a little bit and I started helping her down the aisle of the pharmacy. And I noticed that very shortly from the time I began to assist her, her gait got so much better. You know, she went from walking like to... And then I said to her, you know, you're walking a lot better right now. And she said to me, oh, it's because you're helping me. And so I helped her to a vehicle. She got in. I said bye to her. And... Of course, I was elated. Why? Because I was able to get my Bible study for that day, and I didn't even go out on the street working. So I went home happy, woke up in the morning, as I did at that time. My wife and I were living in this very small basement apartment, so my, 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 my altar was in the bathroom because I could not wake my wife up. And so I was having my morning devotions. Oh, br brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Wherever you place yourself with God, the Spirit of the Lord is there with you. And I was having my worship with the Lord there. And I was refreshed. And, and as I came out of my, my morning personal devotion with the Lord, I looked at my telephone and I noticed that there were several phone calls. From the same number, back to back to back to back to back to back to back. And I was wondering, who is this trying to call me? Then I picked up the phone and I tried to call the number. I could not get through. Busy signal. Called again. Busy signal. Called again. Busy signal. Called again. Busy signal. I fell on my knees and I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know who this is, why they're calling me, but Father, if this is important and you want me to talk to them, open up this line now. I picked up the phone. I called again. The phone began to ring. Then I heard a voice on the other end of the line. Hello? I said, hello. They said, who is this? I said, this is, a, this is Christopher Hudson. I said, who is this? It was the lady that I met just the night previous. Now, I wanted to have a Bible study with her, but I didn't think it was going to happen that quickly. And she began to say to me that she was not feeling good and she needed help. Could I see her that morning? Now I prayed and asked, God, if you want me to talk to this person, open up the line. So I said, of course I can see you. When do you want me to come by and see you? She said, well, I'm at my daughter's house. It will take me about 45 minutes to get home. Can you meet me at my house in 45 minutes? I said, okay. She gave me the address. I said, goodbye. I hung up. She hung up. I got off the phone excited. I'm saying, wow, I'm starting my day with a Bible study. How much better to start my day? And as I'm starting along my way, happy and excited, the Spirit of God said to me, this is not going to be some normal Bible study you're going to. This woman is possessed with a demon. And so now I froze. Because I've never dealt with, at that time, any situation of that nature. All that started running through my mind were some things that I heard some seasoned pastors talk about that had dealt with situations such as this. And so I began to pray. I began to confess my sins. I said, Lord, please cleanse me. Please purify me. I was asking for the Spirit of God to be with me, and I began to pick up all my books. I picked up my Bible. I got everything. And then I made my way out the door. Didn't have a car at that time. I got into a taxi. As I was in the back of the taxi cab, I'm still praying confessing my sins, asking God to be with me. I arrived at the lady's house on time, went to the door, rang the doorbell. Nobody was there. And then I paused and I said, well, Lord, I prayed. You told me that I should go. Nobody's here. Then the Lord told me clearly, open your Bible. And then he told me to open to a specific passage in Scripture. And he said, when you're finished reading it, the woman will arrive. The Lord told me to turn to the instance in the gospel where Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he found his disciples in dispute with the Pharisees. You see, the disciples could not cast out a demon of this young boy. And Jesus rebuked them for the little faith that they had. But before Jesus did his work in delivering that young boy from being possessed by that demon, he inquired of the father, how long has your son been in this condition? And the father let him know that from a youth the son was in this condition and how that sometimes the demon would cast him in the fire and in the water. 
And as I came to the very last word of this instance, I looked up, and there the car was rolling right in front of the house. She parks the car, and I wait there on the doorstep. And I wait there, and I wait there, but she's not getting out of the car. Matter of fact, she doesn't even look over at me. She's looking dead straight on. This is in the mid of the summer, hot in New York. This woman has a scarf wrapped around her head. She's bundled up as if it was snowing outside. And then without looking any other direction, she goes into her purse. She pulls out a pack of cigarettes, pulls out a singular cigarette, places it in her mouth, lights it up, and begins to smoke. And just looks forward. And I'm thinking to myself, while well, I remember the night previous, she had a problem walking, so perhaps it's her arthritis that's keeping her in this vehicle right now. Perhaps I need to go and assist her out of the car. So I walked over to the driver's side window, knocked on the window, said, let's call her name, Pam. I said, Pam, would you like me to help you out of the car? She said, get in. Now remember, I asked God if he wanted me to go. So I got in, and I sat down in the car, and I looked over at her. She says, I need you to go with me. I said, okay. She started her car, and she began to drive. And as we drove down the road, she had the heat all the way turned up. And then she turned the AC all the way up. And then she turned the heat all the way up. Then she turned the AC all the way up. Heat all the way up. AC all the way up. I don't know what to do with myself. But do you remember sometimes in the fire, sometimes in the water? And then remembering how Jesus responded to that situation, I inquired as to her condition. I said, Pam. How long have you been struggling with this arthritis problem? She said, since I was nine. I said, okay, this is real. We reach our destination. We park right out front of FedEx. She continues to steer forward. She never looks over at me once in this whole encounter. And as we parked there in the car, you see the whole time my eyes were fixed on her. But as we parked there in the car, I then began to assess the rest of my surroundings in the vehicle. There were lighters everywhere. Open cigarette packages, some had three in them, some four, some 20, some brand new boxes, unopened. Cigarettes all over the place. Now, I've seen chain smokers before. I've hanged around chain smokers before. I borderline chain smoking before. And that wasn't chain smoking that I was looking at. Then I looked at her and I said, Pam, you do realize that you have a problem. And she just nods her head. And I said, do you realize that your problem is not natural? And she just nods her head. I said to, you, said to her, you do realize that you're dealing with demon possession. She nods her head. I said, Pam, today God wants to deliver you. And a little smile comes up on her face. I said, there's probably there's some things in your home that we're going to need to put into a garbage bag. And after we put those things in a bar garbage bag and clear all of these things out of your house, we're going to pray, Pam. And God is going to deliver you. And a little bigger smile came on her face. And then I said, and we're going to have to get rid of the cigarettes also. And then she said, 
The cigarettes are my pleasure. Jesus said I could keep the cigarettes. The cigarettes are my pleasure. And then I know, then I knew that I had a problem on my hands. So now I'm thinking to myself, what do I do now? It's time for the health message. So I begin to speak to her about how her body is the temple of the living God and how that God desires that she would prosper and be in good health even as her soul prospereth. I, I went through all of these things and I saw her, at least in her facial expressions, responding in the positive. And so as it looked as though the spirit of God truly had her in that right place, I said, and that's why we're going to have to get rid of the cigarettes. Once again, the voice came, the cigarettes are my pleasure. Jesus said I could keep the cigarettes. The cigarettes are my pleasure. You see what's going on here, don't you? But now in my mind, I started to get a bit frustrated. Because God told me that I was going to meet with somebody that's demon possessed today. So in my mind, it's time for the demon to come out. No, brother, and I'm serious. I'm serious. So I'm thinking I'm going to see some foaming at the mouth, some something. But this was going in a completely different direction than what I planned for. And so in my frustration, I said to her, Pam, why did you call me this morning? She said, because you're the only Bible man that I know. I said, Pam, why do you need a Bible man? She went behind the driver's seat with her hands and she pulled out a FedEx envelope and she handed it to me. I said, what does FedEx have to do with anything? And then she said, because FedEx means F the exorcist. I abbreviated it for your hearing. To bring the story to a conclusion, I saw no demon casted out of anyone that day. I did all the right things, said all the right things to her, even asked her, I said, say Jesus is Lord. She would not say it. I asked her why. I said, does it hurt to say that? She said yes. Oh, don't let the devil distract you. Trust me. He doesn't want you to hear. No, 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 brothers and sisters. Father in heaven, I pray that the Holy Spirit will keep our minds. For I know the enemy, how he uses all manner of stupid trickery. But in the name of Jesus, may your spirit keep us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I saw no demon cast it out that day. And I was upset. I, I wondered. I said, God, why? Why? Why didn't I see? Why wasn't the demon cast out? What did I do wrong? And the Lord let me know something that I want you to understand this evening. The reason why no demon was casted out that day was because Pam had to make a choice. If she chose to put all on the altar, God could have delivered her. But she had a cherished sin that she wasn't willing to relinquish. Therefore, she remained in the bondage that the devil had bound her in from since she was nine years old. Brothers and sisters, you have to make a choice. There are some sins that you've been playing with, toying with, and making excuses for. There is no excuse for sin. If there was an excuse for sin, then God wouldn't even have a leg to stand on in this controversy. If there was ever an excuse for sin, if there was ever one intelligent reason for a man to transgress the law of God, sin would cease to be sin. God 
is not playing with sin. God hates sin. He hates the sin that you try to identify as a little thing. He hates it. And the reason that God hates sin is because it separates him from you. And he loves you. He loves you enough that he would die for you. And sin is keeping us away from him. He hates it. And until you hate sin, you can never understand and truly experience the love of God. That's why Jesus said that he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. It was his hatred for sin that made him stretch out his hands and allow his feet to be nailed to that cross. Sin is our enemy. And as long as you continue to cling to that sin in your life, you will remain in bondage to the devil. Tonight. Not later. Tonight. We need to be delivered from sin. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Provision has been made. There is nothing so despicable and miry and degraded about your character that God does not have a remedy for. Tonight, we need to make a decision. Choose you this night whom you will serve. If it's God, then serve God. But if it's sin, have mercy on you. Have mercy on you, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I have two appeals I'm going to make, and then I'm going to wrap up in prayer. I ask you to pray as I make these appeals. Pray for yourself. Pray for everyone else as well. We need to make our calling and election sure. My first appeal is to all of us here this evening that have made a decision. We've been baptized before. We've walked with Jesus, but somewhere along the line, we lost our connection. We've lost our footing. You know that you're not as serious about Jesus as Jesus is about you. And this evening, as, this, as the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart, it is your desire to recommit your life to the service of the living God. If this is the commitment that you desire to make this evening, I invite you to come down front here with me. I want to pray with you. That is my first appeal. Do not allow the eyes of men to keep you from taking your stand. You need to take your stand this evening. That's appeal number one. I'm going to go on to appeal number two, but appeal number one still hangs in the air. Appeal number two. There are some here this evening that have never surrendered their hearts to Jesus Christ. You are here for a purpose. God has drawn you into his courts for such a time as this. Why? He has a plan for your life. And you will never be able to see the heights and the depth and the breadth of God's vision for your existence until you surrender your hearts to the creator, Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling you into his service. Someone invited you here? Oh, no, my friend. 
it's the spirit of God that brought you here. God wants to save you in his kingdom. But even before then, he wants to use you to show this world his glory. But you have to make a decision. It's either going to be this world or it's going to be Jesus. No man can serve two masters. Tonight, Jesus presents to you a choice. He says, come and serve him. And I will do for you exceeding abundantly above that which you can ask or think. Come and serve me. And I will teach you what it means to be a servant of God. Come and serve me. And when all of this is over, and you will have overcome, we will share the throne together. Come and serve me. Or cling to your sin. Cling to your sin. I don't want you to cling to your sin, my child, but cling to your sin. And when I remove sin, I will have to remove you. If you've never given your heart to Jesus before, and tonight you want to say, Lord, I want to be a part of the kingdom of the living God. I want to study your word in preparation to be baptized into the church of the living God. If that is the decision that the Lord is placing on your heart to be a person that studies to be a baptismal candidate of God's remnant church, I invite you to come down front here as well. And if you're already here, I, write, I invite you to raise your hand. Don't worry about anybody else. Oh, don't worry about anybody else. Jesus is calling you. Don't worry about anybody else. Jesus is calling you. There are people here that wouldn't even pay your cell phone bill. Jesus paid with his blood that you might be saved. It's my last call, and then I'm going to kneel in prayer. Last call, then I kneel in prayer. Last call, and then I kneel in prayer. Don't let anything keep you, brother. It's time to make our calling and election sure. I want to be there. It's time to cast away my pride, your pride. Cast time to cast away the selfishness. It's time to go in the gates. It's time to prepare ourselves to meet our maker. It's time, brethren. We are the final generation. It's time. Now is time. Last call. Last call. Is there one other who will say, Lord, I come? This is the time. I'm going to kneel in prayer. And if while we're kneeling in prayer, the Lord moves upon your heart, I invite you still come. Still come. God is calling you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, who is like unto thee, O Lord among the gods, who is like unto thee, there is none. We give you thanks this evening for sending your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for giving your life that we might have life. We give you thanks for tarrying long, tarrying long with our sin and our folly, with our rebellion. But tonight you've called us. 
And because you have given us strength, we have answered your call. We want to be cleansed from our sin. We want the mind of Jesus. We want to serve you, Lord, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And so we simply pray that you would take over in our lives. That you would take over our thoughts, our words, our actions, our goals, everything. Lead us in the way everlasting. Perfect your will in these earthen vessels. Turn our hearts back to you, Lord, those of us that have ran away from the truth. Those of us that have been ashamed of the gospel, turn our hearts back to you, Lord, that we might serve you in spirit and in truth. And for the precious souls, O oh Lord, the precious souls that you called to enter into your kingdom, to have their names inscribed in the Lamb's book of life for the very first time this evening, we say hallelujah, glory be to the Lamb. And I pray in a special way for them, Father, that you would send our brothers, the heavenly angels, to surround them and to keep them and to encourage them to walk in the light even as thou art in the light. May none of these, O Lord, that you have called be plucked out of your hand. But may all that kneel here in your presence this evening be saved in your kingdom. Thank you for hearing this, our most humble prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.